Yeah. Well, um, I am here to give a report, or to give a speech more or less, uh, about the Battle of Gettysburg. Um, now, first off, I want you to forget where you are for a few minutes for me. Forget that you're in this school, forget even that you're in this state, and uh, think yourself a soldier. Just, just try it. Uh, you're, you're out in the summer heat, you're in full uniforms like these, um, and you're campaigning for days on end. You've marched about 100 miles in five days, uh, 20 miles a day about. You stop every hour or so to get a drink of water, and then you march on through the dust. Uh, anyways, you are a private, and you don't have much to do besides take orders. Uh, these people, they don't have any say in what goes on. They are pretty much expendable. But uh, they are the core of the army. They, they are the life of the army and they will do whatever the commander said. Now, in Gettysburg, uh, we have a build-up to Gettysburg. The cavalry of the Confederacy was the eyes and ears of the army, and that was their job. Now, a couple months prior to Gettysburg, they had gone off on the road. They had just lost sight of the, the army altogether. They uh, actually, they did wind up in an engagement with the Union cavalry, at Brandy Station, that was about May 30th. Today, well, this week. Um, <clears throat> yeah, they get in an engagement. Uh, about 2,000 cavalrymen flash on this huge, dusty field, and uh, you get what would resemble this, which I think. Uh, and uh, the Confederacy loses. They instigated this fight. They lost. So they uh, they ride up into Pennsylvania, way up in Pennsylvania, to redeem themselves because they didn't want to you know, share this loss with the rest of the army. And the army, by this time, is totally blind. They don't know what's going on, the Confederate army. Anyways, they start their trek up into Pennsylvania that same month. Uh, they spend all June doing it. Uh, the Union army is close behind, I'd say about four days behind. And they are trekking just as hard as the Confederates were. Finally, uh, General Lee, who's the Confederate leader, he finds himself north of Gettysburg, and he knows that the Union is coming up behind. He doesn't know how close. He hears from the scout that they're only two hours behind him, and that was very, very close. <clears throat> so what he did was he instantly turned his army around and converged on this town of Gettysburg. Uh, now beforehand, um, the army had been tired, they were without food, and one thing that I had mentioned before during my first report was that they had no shoes. The men had, their shoes were worn away. So uh, a little Confederate scout party comes into Gettysburg. Do you want to play this for a to a future They come into Gettysburg from the north. The south comes in from the north. They're up in Pennsylvania. You get a, Confederate line coming in, Gettysburg, in search of shoes, of all things. Well, uh, this same day, the uh, Union cavalry, they had noticed them there. They didn't like that. <laughs> you know, if they, they see Confederates, there's a couple thousand cavalrymen, there's one unit, one company, let's say about a hundred men, the Confederates, and of course they're not going to run away. They have the manpower to flush them. So what they do was the uh, Union cavalry puts a line right about here, and uh, the Confederates once again instigate a fight. About 100 Confederates against 2,000 cavalrymen doesn't last long. Uh, <laughs> Confederates pull back instantaneously and call up support. Lee had no intentions of this battle to start. Uh, he did not want them to be on an offensive right here, right at this point. Um, but his men couldn't hold back because his brigadier generals just said, go for it. So what they did was, <clears throat> they pulled in thousands more troops right here, reinforced this one here, part of this one right here. So you get one sort of like that against all those Confederate uh, cavalry. And the cavalry have about 2,000 men. I'd say there's about 10,000 Confederates. 
my big brother. <laughs> but uh, they do have one little trick up their sleeve. Confederates carry what are called carbines. They uh, can fire about seven shots, as the infantryman can only fire one. And it loads up the breech, so it's a lot easier to load. You break it in half, like a shotgun. You load the bullets in there, pop it up and fire. They uh, pull out 10,000 Confederates for about two hours. Um, meanwhile, the Union gets up support from John Reynolds, who is a uh, renowned general, uh, Brigadier General Corps commander. And uh, he not only backs up the Union line, he has so many men that the cavalry can just retire by this time. So the cavalry gets out of here, and the, uh, this would now be the Union infantry line, and they are well, well backed up. Well, uh, Lee, by this time, is distraught. He did not want this to happen, but since it has happened, there's no way to pull back. He orders thousands. March in, come here, and they, the Union, are pushed right through Gettysburg, and they fall back to this line here. And they reform over nightfall, and what is important right here, I'll show you one thing. By that time, that line is broken. Confederates are surrounding the town, and they make a new base right along this ridge here, right parallel to that Union line. <coughs> there was a major mistake right here. A man by the name of uh, Ewell, Confederate General Ewell, had this man right here before this line was ever made. He decided, against the will of others, not to take the hill, which was an idiot action. It allowed, uh, over the nightfall, thousands more reinforcements came in. Made this line stretch all the way down here, backed up this one, and surrounded this hill. They were entrenched. They were behind rocks. They were behind trees. They were attacked. <laughs> they had no problems. Um, okay, that was the first day. That was July 1st. The second day, it starts in the morning. Ewell has to redeem his actions. He's, he attacks the side. He attacks the flank. He is pushed out of there like he's nothing. He's like he's a rack. So uh, he, he is distraught here, and, and Lee just doesn't know what to do with him. Uh, Lee orders the march. From this point here, <coughs> around about here, to go around the Union line. Well, that doesn't work because there are some guys with binoculars right here. They see his every move, and he notices that. So what he has to do, which takes about five hours to do, is get back up here, and all the way back down, back down around the seminary ridge, around the mountain, so they can't see him. Uh, this is where things start falling apart. There is a man by the name of Sickles. He in general, he extends his line. Is that right? Anyways, uh, he extends his line too thin. He has about one man every uh, 20 feet. And that's nothing compared to the oncoming Confederates. Well, the Confederates get right about here, and he starts falling back. He starts falling. He gets his man, he gets out of there. Anyways, this is the same. Okay, you can finish with this one to this one. He uh, gets right about here, and he sees these Confederates. He doesn't know what to do. So, uh, instantly, some uh, signal caught up on, on Little Round Top. He had ever seen one of these Confederate Games twice. And the signal corps officer orders uh, about five regiments up there immediately, or they're going to lose. Out. So, yeah, a bunch of regiments right up here, and one, this is very important right here, 20th May, they must hold the Union flank. They have guys, uh, where are they looking like that? From the right now. And, uh, their orders not to move, not to move under any circumstance, and whether they have five guys that cannot move before the line will class, resulting in but it's getting around the Union side, coming from behind, smashing them from front and behind, and it will occur. So, he does. He 
uh, converts the line right down here. And 15th Alabama comes right up by the 20th on their flight, right up on. Nobody expected it. But uh, Chamberlain, the leader of the 20th Maine, his name is Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, a very important figure, uh, and some here actually. Tell you about he, uh, he knows what would happen if his long broke. He looks exactly what would happen. All soldiers know that if they lost their line, they would lose the war because this place was so far north. This was the whole Union Army of the North. If all they had to do was get around that line, get the theater of Washington, D.C., they would now be living in the Confederate States of America. But, uh, this, uh, this smart fellow, he's a, he's a college professor. He studied Roman tactics in the school and rhetoric. Uh, he, he knew what he had to do. Um, the Confederates tried attacking about five times. Five times they were repulsed each time. But the last time, the sixth time he came up, the uh, 20th employees were out of bullets. They didn't know. They didn't have any more bullets, no more ammunition, no nothing. So, this is the chamber. He uh, orders a bayonet charge. And this is very brave, considering how close the Alabamians were and how many of them He uh, not only orders a charge, you see, you see this line here? This line stays just like it is. This line comes down like this. It shuts them off. It shuts them off until right about here. Like a, like a door. Think of a door. It's a swinging door. Just pushes one off the mountain, and the other side comes down and collapses right on the ground. And about an hour later, the mountain was secure, the line was secure, Lee was out with his mom. He was furious. Uh, okay, that's the second thing. And again, you will attack tonight. Uh, um, now the third day, very important. I'm sure you've all heard of Pickett's Charge. I don't know. Okay, just um, What this was, was we ordered the frontal assault of about 12,000 men or so across a big field here to slam right into the uh, Union's front. What's that going to do now? I mean, that does nothing. You slam into another front, and these guys are entrenched. You can't do anything. General Longstreet, one of uh, Lee's advisors, argues the whole time. He, he has argued about the whole war. He's argued about the whole thing here. He knew it was going to fail. He saw it before they ever conceived it. Well, uh, Long, uh, Lee won't listen to me. He just refuses. And his men, they don't know. You know, the privates like, like me, they wouldn't know anything. Uh, they just, they're just following what Lee says because in their mind, he is equivalent to God. He is leading them, and they will fall in anger. Well, uh, Longstreet, under the law, has to follow these orders, no matter what. So, he orders one of his general to pick it. This one up this man. Right along here. I don't know if seven areas. But before he does that, he lines up a cannon. He's got a cannon line from about here to here, a mile of line. Cannons, just full on cannons. It ended up to be the biggest cannonade in U.S. history. It was uh, about an hour long. They shelled right down here, right to the middle here. That's, that's the big area where they're going. Because they had to weaken that line to be able to push their troops. Well, about an hour into it, the uh, cannon commander says, Long sure you have to start the, you have to start the battle or I can't back you up. Longstreet is so against it, he just he doesn't know what to do. So he tells Pickett to, he doesn't even say anything, he just says, just throws his hand. Just throws his hand. He doesn't want to say it because it'll be on his conscience for the rest of his life. He knows it's going to happen. So Pickett comes up with something right here, and they, about the same length as the cannon, can march out in the field a mile long. Mile long event. Can you imagine? I mean, just looking on either side of you, seeing men run. Once they come out of the woods, they are under fire from every gun on the field. Every artillery piece in the Every cannon. 
Every tenant is not here, they're firing down there. Every tenant is down there, they're all firing. And they are about half strength when they get to right here. And uh, most of them don't even move the wall. They don't make this, this road right here. They're, they're going around time to get down. One unit did, however, manage to climb. They still know right about there. And as soon as they did, about every minute was shot. They just, they didn't have, they didn't have the strength. And we lost about 13,000 men that may have uh, And that was, you know, the view was, it was so, it was just not, he had to get out of there. Long Street was in tears that day. And uh, as soon as the battle was over, um, General Pickett approaches Lee. And uh, Lee looks down from him, down to him on his horse, and he says, General Pickett, you must form your division behind the hill. And Pickett turns to him, looks right dead in the eye, and says, General Lee, I have no division. And right there, Lee knew what he did. And he had been blind to it the whole time. That is why the South Los Gettysburg, they would not, Lee would not tolerate listening to others. He would not have, he would not have none advice other than his own. The first day, or the second day rather, he could have easily gone around this big hill here and smashed him from behind. They didn't have anything that, no. No, he didn't, he didn't do that. He would not listen. And in return, we pulled out with a trail of Devon wounded 27 miles long. Can you imagine? There's said to be 50,000 men died in three days just in this, in this battle. <coughs> Now what I want you to think is, uh, what would have happened had not we made those mistakes? Is it our benefit, or was it, uh, you know, did you want to be in the South, uh, the Confederacy? I don't think that would have been a very promising life. I think that we should be thankful for every man that gave his life then, Confederate or Union, had not the uh, battle taken place and had not the had taken place just the way it did, we would now be living in the Confederate States of America. That is just the very truth of it. Because if we had broken this line, he would have gotten Washington, he would have smashed Washington. We would have had, uh, Lincoln would have had to sign a document, a treaty, and not have been in So, do you think that the 50,000 men that perished died in vain, or do you think that there was a truly good reason that they gave their lives? And you know they thought there was every side, every but every person out there died for a reason. They were giving it all, even though the Confederates may have been a little bit off on a different tangent. They uh, they had their reasons, and I'm sure only a very few of them actually fought for slavery. In fact, before the war even started, or actually before this battle ended, Longstreet had uh, said once to a friend, uh, "We should have freed the slaves, then fired them for something." And that proves right there that a lot of the Confederates weren't fighting for slavery, that they're merely fighting for what they believe to be states, states rights, which, which is the uh, U.S. history lesson. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, every man out there died for a reason. They gave all, and they would have done it again, I'm sure, if the circumstances were the same. Any questions? Yeah. Um, what do you think about the Next summer is the 135th anniversary of Gettysburg. Uh, should be, as I'm prophesizing, the biggest string enactment in history. Uh, ten years ago, the 1988 one was the biggest, and I think that in 19, uh, 1998 will surpass that. Yeah, I plan to go out next year, next yeah. summer.
These are my paintings. And uh, I am donating them to Mr. Overson oh, for any nice. future use. <laughs> could you pass them around so we could see them, please? Yes, uh, <laughs> you can see my paintings. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you for having me. I thoroughly enjoyed this. I and, uh, enjoyed it. Perhaps you will be able, able to go out to Ray one day. There are a lot of is there up there some movies? Is, is it like Gettysburg. Yes. Gettysburg. Gettysburg. Yes. Four hour long movie. Four hours. Yes. I have it at my house. But every hour, every minute is worth it. I want to see it now. Oh, it's, 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 it's very good.